Hello, <laughs> welcome to the League of Voters of Lane County's virtual third Thursday. I'm Charles E. Kaler, president of the Lane County's League. Thanks for signing in. You'll have an opportunity to ask the speaker questions at the end of her presentation. Go to the Q&A button and type in your questions. First, a bit of business. The people of Lane County live on the traditional land of the Kalapuya people whose descendants are citizens of the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians of Oregon. We honor with gratitude the land and the people who have cared for it. We reaffirm our commitment to st stewardship through our work. Election season is over, kind of. The heavy lifting prior to voting is done and the league's work goes on. Voter service led by Paula Grisafi can take a breather kind of. The action committee chaired by Terry Parker is where the action is, pun intended, all year round by directing the league's efforts on community concerns. Members, membership never rests, recruiting new and nurturing current members. Their latest project was the new directory you'll be seeing in your mailbox soon. Thanks Veronica and Kim. Thanks to all who do our important work year round. Okay, doing a little technical stuff here. There we go. On to our speaker, state representative and longtime league mate member, Nancy Nathanson. As Linda Lynch wrote in last month's Argus, in a time when words and phrases such as hoax and fake news and alternative facts are used to describe the day's happenings or to advance a certain point of view, Representative Nathanson provides us with an honest, issue-centered look at our current news. She is known to be data-driven in her legislative decision-making, which means she can explain her decisions with actual information rather than anecdotes or bias. Representative Nathan Nathanson served for 12 years on the Eugene City Council before being elected to the state legislature in 2006. Professionally, she worked for 37 years for academic libraries, including the U of O. In her time at the legislature, she has come to be relied upon for her detailed knowledge of state budgets, as well as tax policy, transportation policy, and a host of other issues. House District 13 is primarily North Eugene from I-5 to Highway 99, with most of downtown Eugene included. Nancy writes on her legislative homepage, I have focused my efforts over the years on protecting seniors, consumers, and children local needs and good government efforts to make government work smarter. That last part of her statement, of course, reflects her long membership in the League of Women Voters. I am honored to introduce League member, state legislator, and tap dancer, Nancy <laughs> Nathanson, discuss the challenges before the 2021 legislature. Oh, hello. thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> and and now uh, for anyone who didn't know that fun little thing about me, <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was a tap dancer. Thank you. So uh, you'd like to know what the next legislative session will bring. Well, me too. Uh, I'm heading into my eighth term as a state representative and I can't think of any other session that will come even close to this in terms of uncertainty, and maybe not even for the last century, because we don't know exactly what we'll have to deal with, and we also don't know exactly how we're going to deal with getting our business done. How will we get it done? I spent some time thinking about how to organize my thoughts for you today, and I came up with an outline of what and how. But before we get there, I know your work for many years includes registering voters and encouraging voting. So I thought I'd do a quick recap of some election stats that I think are interesting. We have 2,951,000 plus registered voters as of November 3rd. So out of that number, there were 2,317,965 ballots returned. So that rate of return is 78.5%. 
Lane did better than the state average, uh, than the state vote. Lane did 80.1%. Lane in its percentage of votes cast was surpassed only by Benton, Deschutes, Gilliam, Grant, Harney, Hood River, Sherman, Wallowa, Washington, and Wheeler County, but they were all really close. In terms of ballots cast, Lane County, where there were 219,000 ballots cast, was surpassed only by the Tri-County areas in Portland, Clackamas, Multnomah, and Washington. So we contribute a lot of the ballots to the total for the state of Oregon. While the number of votes cast is way up from the 2016 election, the percentage of voting is similar, both around 80%. That's because the number of registered voters uh, is also way up. The number of registered voters has increased by about 400,000 people from 2016 to 2020. A large amount of those newly registered voters, you all are very well, well, well aware because you discussed it in your meetings. Um, it can be attributed to the motor voter law, which automatically registers Oregonians as non-affiliated voters when they get or renew a driver's license, ID card, or a permit from the Department of Motor Vehicles. Also in that period then, of course, from 2016 to 2020, the number of unaffiliated voters increased by more than 250,000 quarter million, right? So um, it, let's move now to something that I hadn't necessarily planned to talk about because I wanted to talk about the next session. But when I was reviewing this uh, yesterday with Linda Lynch, uh, there was a comment that since we just had the economic and revenue forecast yesterday, you might be interested to hear. And what we've learned uh, is sobering. It's not all good news, it's not all bad news. Things are pretty okay. The bottom line, the main message is that we're sort of stabilized right now since the September forecast. Things continue to look a little better. The ending fund balance for this biennium is positive. It's going to be way over a billion dollars, but before you think, wow, that's a lot of money, they should spend it all, remember that it's prudent to have money ready going into the next biennium because uh, there's a, a standard operating uh, protocol, you might say, of having two to three months in reserves for operating expenses in case of an emergency. Of course, we're in an emergency now, but what if there's a deeper or additional emergency? So it's always prudent to keep some reserves. So we're going into the next biennium with uh, a, a, an even larger ending fund balance than we thought we would. Uh, the economists continue to assume there's going to be another federal stimulus package, but it will be smaller than the last one. Initially, they warned that to get back to where we were before the pandemic, it would take until midpoint in the 2020s. But now they're saying we could get back to pre pandemic employment by 2023. So at this point, I wanna share with you uh, a screen, uh, something that I have grabbed off of the economists presentations. I think it'll take just a moment for the picture to load. There we go. So here's what the forecast looks like. That's pretty darn good, right? This peak here is when we got the CARES Act, the federal stimulus money. This second peak early in 2021 is what the economists are projecting will happen, that we will receive some stimulus money and we will continue our upward trajectory. That's what the forecast is showing. But they also tell us that it is absolutely imperative that because the economic forecast is inextricably linked with the health forecast, we've got to get control over coronavirus 19, COVID-19, uh, for us to get back to where we were. So even the economists emphasize the need to address the pandemic. 
And now this one is even more interesting. It shows you how long it has taken us to pull out of other recessions. You will see here, I know this is um, a sort of a wild looking chart, but once you settle in and uh, get patient, most of the other recessions that we're looking at were caused from an economic problem. We are in a self-imposed recession. The economy was basically solid when the pandemic struck. So the underpinnings of our economy are really all right. So you'll see in this red line, wow, we really tanked right away, but look how fast we're coming back and then we will continue to come back. It shows that they are projecting uh, that we're gonna come back within, the, 2020 doesn't mean, uh, it, this is the way they're identifying this economic crisis. It's the 2020 crisis. They're anticipating this will take about three and a half years to come back. In the 2007 crisis, this dark black line, it took us over seven years to come back from that one. And from this slump down here, the light gray line, that was the 1980 slump that took us over seven years to come back. So you'll see that they're predicting this one, we're gonna come back quicker. So that's actually very good news. I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute now. Uh, so a little bit more on the forecast. I wanna get some of the bad news out of the way first. The unemployment support ends the day after Christmas and there is no current federal support for business and the moratorium on residential evictions ends December 31st and some rent payments are due January 1st and the rest are due March 31st. So this has a lot of us worried about how to continue to shore up our individuals and families and businesses. The leisure and hospitality businesses were struck very hard. They're still suffering. Some sectors will face longer run or structural challenges. Brick and mortar retailers and most manufacturing subsectors could stay suppressed for a long time or even have a more permanent downsizing. But that's not because of the pandemic. That's because those sectors were already looking at some potential restructuring anyway. The early recoveries have been in healthcare and office jobs. The winners really with employment increases uh, include all of those home improvement stores and home improvement services, the transportation and warehousing, groceries and food and beverage stores so, and software. The housing sector remains strong because higher income households who tend to be homeowners uh, have been less impacted by the recession and are trying to take advantage of record low interest rates. But here are some things to keep in mind. The forecast continues to obscure the painful impacts being felt by low-income Oregonians who've been disproportionately affected. Caretakers who are especially women have been disproportionately dropping out of the workforce since the start of the pandemic. The already existing income inequality has been made worse. Those impacts are falling disproportionately on Black, Indigenous, and people of color, BIPOC communities across the state. And as I mentioned earlier, as the economists have been telling us since last spring, economic recovery depends on health recovery. People will have to feel safe and confident and be safe and confident to start visiting stores and restaurants as much as they did a year ago. So um, now let's get on to the legislative session. And uh, I think I'll show you a few pictures really quickly again of what a session is like. Uh, it, for those of you who haven't been to visit us up in Salem, this is opening ceremonies. This is what it normally would have looked like in January when we get sworn in. Uh, I don't think it's gonna look like that at all. We will not be open. You'll see the gallery 
is full of people here. The floor of the house is full of members. We get sworn in, we sign an oath of office. This is the view from my desk in the house chamber on a normal day. Uh, my computer, my papers, some people are at their desks, some people are milling around. Here's another view, a lot of milling around. Some people are in the gallery. We work with each other during a floor session. Uh, some of you think it looks like barely organized chaos, I'm sure, but this is a time when we have to talk with each other. So uh, that's what we do sometimes. Uh, I will go visit people in the hall. Uh, people come to visit us and lobby us. This is what it's like before a committee hearing. The rooms are full. That's me talking to someone in the front row before their testimony begins. As I mentioned, lots of people normally would come visit us in the building. That's not gonna happen, I don't think. And then at home, normally I meet with groups all the time throughout the year. And we have town halls. Well, some of you have noticed we haven't had in-person town halls, but we have had, just like you're having a presentation today, we have Zoom meetings for neighborhood organization meetings. And we even had a couple of Zoom town hall meetings. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute and talk about um, the context of having a next session. We have disasters and recovery efforts going on in most counties around the state. The economic and health and housing issues, losing jobs to the pandemic and losing homes to wildfires. But we probably haven't heard the last of the emergencies yet caused by the wildfires because water sources may become polluted if we haven't finished cleaning up the ash and debris, hauling it away from the stream banks. And where trees have burned, they may become unstable in the rains and become a threat to lives, to homes, to roads. You know that trees topple. Sometimes uh, a road is out of commission and impassable until they can move trees but also sometimes the soil becomes unstable and there are lads, landslides. So we, even though we think we may have been out of the woods with the wildfires, there still may be some more emergencies uh, facing us as the winter rains come in. There is pressure to lower taxes for businesses that are struggling. And there's pressure to raise taxes to help shore up the budget and help people who are struggling. So you can see the dilemma right away. There's pressure to spend money right now to help people with rents and leases so that people don't lose their homes and so that businesses aren't shuttered. But there's also pressure to hold on to the reserves because things may get worse. And the flu season is now on us and could be a further strain on the public health systems. That's why there's an increased effort, you may have noticed, for public information campaigns about getting a flu shot. For those people who feel like it's safe for them to get a flu shot, please get the flu shot. And since the symptoms of flu and coronavirus are very similar, experts are warning that confusion over the two could overburden the COVID-19 testing capacity and we know that there are, uh, um, there's some instability in the supply and in the length of time for testing. So that's the context right now that we're facing as we think about planning for an 81st assembly. So what might get discussed and what might get done? Well, first of all, the assembly changes every two years. All the representatives and half the senators are up for election. Because I'm elected to the House, some of my focus right now in, in what I tell you about will be the House. Who won't be there? Who will be there? The House will see 12 new members, but that's about an average turnover over the past. So who won't be there? Some of our most senior members will no longer be there. Most notably, uh, Jeff Barker, a retired police officer who chaired judiciary for many years. Caddy McEwen, 
who was my roommate for several years. She is a former port commissioner and Coos Bay school board member who co-chaired the historic and complex and monumental investment in transportation infrastructure. Margaret Doherty, a retired educator who chaired education. Alyssa Kenny Geyer, a passionate advocate and human services and housing chair after several years of hard work passed legislation banning toxic toys and a lot of other things to her credit. And finally, Mitch Greenlick, who chaired the health care committee, fought for health care as a human right. Mitch uh, passed earlier this year. But who will be there? Younger faces and people of color. We will have 12 new members of the House, which is about an average turnover. Three quarters of the incoming class, though, is women. And women will make up 50% of the House, half. Compare that to uh, in the past, we've been at about a quarter, we'll be 50% women in the House. The national average is about 29%. So who's coming? I wanted to let you know, I, I'm picking a few. Ricky Rees, a 25-year-old, the youngest member from Gresham who works as a Gresham Community Service Coordinator. Jason Kropp from Bend, formerly a public defender and now a deputy district attorney and serves on a CASA board and the Park and Recreation Board. Lily Morgan, a parole officer and reserve sheriff sergeant. Wins Bay Campos, the daughter of immigrants working as a case manager for Family Promise of Beaverton. Dacia Graber, a firefighter from Tigard. Lisa Reynolds, a pediatrician who describes herself as a leader with Moms Demand Action for Gun Sense and co-founder of Indivisible Oregon. Con Pam, a, a working mom and community activist, daughter of parents who immigrated from Vietnam. Bobby Levy, who helped form the Eastern Oregon Women's Coalition and advocates for farmers and ranchers. And Zach Hudson, a high school teacher and city councilor from Troutdale. So it's going to be a really exciting, different kind of group. So what might be on the agenda? I'll try to get through this really quickly now. Uh, pandemic response for, <clears throat> for public health, pandemic response for the economy, wildfire, climate change, systemic racism, housing, and budget. Wow, all of those. I tend to think of these in buckets. First of all, there's a lot of pent up enthusiasm for what was in the works when the 2020 February session collapsed. I'll just say it that way. We ended in limbo without even adjourning sine die since we lacked a quorum to take an official action to end. When the legislature adjourned, there were more than 200 bills left on the table, including funding for wildfire disaster relief, policies concerning adoptions, broadband for rural areas, and capping the cost of insulin. So uh, there is a lot of pent up enthusiasm to make progress on those bills that are written, they were in the works, uh, we just couldn't get them finished. Uh, second, we'll be responding to the events of 2020, racial justice and police accountability high on the list, the pandemic, we have lots of issues of health and healthcare, public education, the economy, workplace issues, the economic instability of individuals and businesses that I mentioned a little bit in the economic forecast. Uh, for wildfire resilience and recovery, you know, there were 1.2 million acres burned. That is more than twice the average over the past decade. Nine fatalities, more than a thousand people are still in shelter, and more than 4,000 residences were destroyed. The EPA has completed the hazardous waste cleanup uh, for around 2,000 of the properties, and the work is ongoing. Office of Emergency Management is working with insurance companies to help survivors. OHA received uh, money from the e-board for water testing. Uh, it's a lot, a lot of detail. The next bucket is uh, there will be, of course, continued interest in the environment and human rights, police accountability, uh, and uh, the next issue is one that you all track very closely, the census. We need to complete redistricting in response to the 2020 census, but there's a hitch. We're at the mercy of federal actions, 
and to some extent national politics. Will the census data be completed and available to Oregon in time for us to comply with our state mandate? The current statutory deadline for the Census Bureau to share the data with states for redistricting is March 31st, but the Bureau has asked Congress to delay the deadline for releasing data until July 31st. By then, we would be adjourned because our constitutional mandate is to complete our work it, during our session, and we must complete our session within 160, within 160 days. There are also um, interruptions in normal activities due to the pandemic. Uh, there were interruptions due to wildfires. There are questions on the national level about counts for towns that include colleges, that would be us here, and whether to include all residents, all residents or only documented residents. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, unclear, uh, uh, there's just a lack of clarity, I guess, around the census and redistricting right at this time. The next bucket, there will be lots of new ideas from new members. We don't know what they're going to be yet. And then there's always new ideas percolating. I'm working on one this year that I think is especially interesting. Uh, and I have a constituent to thank for it. In a nutshell, it aims to reduce the redundant paperwork and costs associated with renting an apartment or a home. Uh, take, uh, take, for example, a prospective renter is looking for a place, especially in this really competitive environment with a shortage of housing. The renter or prospective renter often needs to submit applications to four or five different places to hope to get one and can spend over 200 or $300 on all those applications, which is a really significant burden for people who are struggling to just keep up with rent and deposit for a single month. So we're trying to address those multiple applications. Uh, we need to figure out paying for wildfires. We need to figure out uh, what kind of land use patterns are changing over time. That's a long-term thing. But finally, uh, before I wrap it up this section, I thought I would just speculate with you a little about how we're actually gonna get our business done. The legislature's professional nonpartisan staff have been discussing it for months, developing best case, worst case, and most likely case scenarios to evaluate the risk for members and potentially staff working in the building for the coming session. They've looked at guidelines from the CDC, Oregon Health Authority, OSHA, and the governor's office to make data-driven recommendations to the speaker and the Senate president. All the while, they're taking steps to make it possible for us to hold some virtual meetings. We had some this summer, and we just had our, for example, uh, House and Senate Revenue Committees meet online yesterday to get the economic and revenue forecast. But, you know, we have a limited amount of uh, space and time to get an enormous amount of business done in a really atypical way. In a current year, we'll have up to 2,700 bills written. We might handle hearings on 1,400 bills in a normal session. Can we really handle 1,400 hearings in this kind of a situation? Let me show you some pictures. I'm gonna share my screen again. So this is what it looked like when I was there for a short session a few months ago. We wore our masks on the house floor. It, that means in the house chamber. This is what it was like when we were chairing a, a revenue committee online. The public can watch real time live, just like you can watch uh, now uh, or pre-pandemic. But because of the protocols for the special session, after consulting with health experts, it was determined that no more than 25 people could be in the house chamber at a time. So most of the members 
were in their offices watching. This is a picture of me watching the Speaker of the House <laughs> on cl the closed circuit television that we all have in our offices. Uh, most of us were in our offices watching, only 25 people at a time in the House chamber. None of the staff for members was in the building. When I carried a bill in the special session, I wore a mask when I was speaking. I was the first to do that. And here's a picture that someone snapped of me congratulating someone for passing his bill earlier. Uh, only you can tell no one else was sitting at their desk. Uh, it was very sparse in there. And how did we vote? You know, we have a voting system. We press a button that's on our desk. That's what this button, green button is here. But I've put some red arrows because no more than 25 could be on the main floor of the house chamber. We changed our rules to allow people to vote from the third floor gallery. This is normally where the public would be. No public was in the building but this short red arrow shows the door to the hallway and the connection to that wing, the house wing of the state capitol. People would walk in through that short, uh, that door, and you can see there's someone here who is with a thumb up or down, I can't tell. There's someone voting here with a thumb up, someone voting here with a thumb up, and it's outside the picture, but down here, at the um, area where the chief clerk sits, the chief clerk is looking at them and acknowledging and registering their vote into the vote system. So that's how voting happened with social distancing. So one way or another, we will press on and we will get our business done. And this has got to be one of the most exciting times ever I can think of to be a legislator. Difficult, stressful, but it will be exciting to be a member of the legislature. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Representative Nate Nathanson. It's, it's your turn now, leaguers. Uh, go to the Q&A button and ask your questions. While you're doing that, um, I wanna thank the people you don't see behind the webinar. Rhonda Livesey is the guru behind this presentation, Zoom meetings and our website. Linda Lynch recruits and coordinates our speakers. Terry Parker and Linda Ferdosian are helping with the questions you'll be asking. Okay, so uh, start asking questions. I have, I, I, Nancy, I know how busy you're going to be with uh, the fire issues and the pandemic. The league thinks forward beyond that. And we've been working on um, discussions about childcare. Under COVID, this has been an issue of critical concern. Uh, is there anything that you know of that will be worked on to help working parents help with childcare services? I'm not on the committees that normally handle that. It is very high up on the list. Even the state economists included childcare as one of the critical elements to address in uh, shoring up uh, people just for this time period, as well as trying to prevent what may be some people permanently exiting the workforce. Uh, it, it's a huge concern. It's affordability, but it's also safety and availability of child care. All of those uh, need to be, um, it, it need additional attention and investment. I guess that's the best word I can think of, it, additional investment, because it's important for the families and in a macro sense, it's important to the state's economy more generally to make sure that childcare is safe and available and affordable. 
you know, it, it, one of the things, uh, it, when you think about everything that will it goes into each one of those, safe, available, affordable, PPE comes to mind, social distancing comes to mind, and I have huge concerns about PPE and testing. I've been working on a bill regarding that. I don't know if we'll talk about it later. Uh, if someone wants to write to me about it, I'm happy to share the description with you. Um, but yes, it's high on the list for the Human Services Committee and also the people uh, concerned with economic development. Very good. Um, something else that um, we're working on is, um, or our, the league is always concerned about, is how are how's the Oregon legislature that you know of anyway uh, to deal with issues at the election department statewide? Are there any problems that need to be addressed? Is the question related perhaps to recent news about the departure of uh, the person who oversaw the elections? Um, I can't say. <laughs> uh, oh. it, this is a question that was just asked. So, but, but I, I imagine we are all aware of that and curious about that. So if you've got yes. any answers. I don't have any insider knowledge about that personnel change. I can tell you that for several years, there has been legislative interest in how the office of the Secretary of State was spending HAVA money, Help America Vote Act. That money is almost all gone now, but it was a, a huge amount of money that the federal government had released to states. And then states could spend it on several different kinds of things like helping each county uh, purchase new equipment. Sometimes it was it, the old hardware, whether you're talking about a computer or a, a, a counting machine. So sometimes it was used for that. Sometimes it was used for other types of improvements. So it, the legislators involved in the ways and means process, particularly had their eye on watching that, but there's, you know, it, it, when you have separated responsibilities, a separately elected secretary of state, it's a separate constitutional office and they can oversee and manage their affairs separately, just as the state treasurer's office is separate. It, the relationship between the legislature and those offices is a little different than it is between the legislature and the executive branch, where we can set policy and be very clear about how money should be allocated and what programs and services uh, should be offered. The relationship with the independently elected uh, statewide officials is different. It, so even though the legislature allocates the money and says, we want the money spent on these software improvements. And one of my concerns has been, of course, cybersecurity. Uh, we, can, um, we can do a certain amount of asking and we hope to have really good productive relationships with that office, uh, but we can't oversee it in the same way that we can executive branch agencies. Um, is there concern about technical infrastructure beyond the election, elections division? Security, and, for instance? Uh, it, statewide, certainly, yes. What One of the issues that interests me is um, it, it, the issue of ransomware and when uh, it's not only individuals and businesses who are sometimes held hostage with a ransomware attack, there are state agencies in other states and there, uh, there have even been counties and other public entities in Oregon that have been held hostage and subject to ransomware. Cybersecurity is serious. I called for a hearing on this topic 
in the Joint Legislative Committee on Information Management and Technology. That's a mouthful. I co-chair that with a state senator. It's a joint House and Senate committee. So I called for a hearing and we invited not only some state officials, but I called for a, a, local, um, a local agency, a state agency, a business person to give us his personal example, and the FBI came and testified also. Also the Department of Justice. This will be a continuing issue for us. Um, it's serious. All right. Um, probably you'll be hearing from the league as other uh, legislators uh, asking about priorities, but here's one that, uh, you'll probably be asked again, um, how can the league uh, collaborate for pre-session filing sponsors? And how do you feel about rerunning our HB 2234 to replace ORSTAR and OCVR? Uh, oh, my. <laughs> um, That's pretty technical. It, I don't... It, it, yes, uh, and collaborating on pre-session filing I don't know who might have uh, put that bill into the hopper. Uh, there are always ways for us to collaborate, but pre-session, it's a little difficult because sometimes legislators are cagey about which bills they're having written because you you want to see you want to see the language and test the waters a little bit behind the scenes, right? Um, the, uh, for example, I have submitted 14 bills. I don't know that I will drop all 14. Sometimes if I ask another legislator, what are you working on? They'll tell me more often than not, they won't. Uh, if, if advocates such as the league know that there's a bill, it would be great if you would connect people because we don't know about your proposed bill and where it is, because right now it's all confidential, unless someone is choosing to proactively share it. So uh, write, call, uh, and, and, and specifically, what would you like uh, that one specific bill to do next year? Very good. Okay, another... Um, issue that's um, in the news still I heard on NPR about this this morning again. Uh, can you address the defund the police uh, and how funds could be redirected or allocated to help with mental illness attendees or programs like CAHOOTS? Um, in 2015, was it that long ago? I think so. <laughs> I elevated the CAHOOTS program by inviting White Bird to the state legislature to come provide testimony in front of my committee. When I was uh, handling the agenda for the Human Services Subcommittee of Ways and Means, I wanted this model of emergency response to be considered, not only considered, I wanted to help elevate it and expand it more broadly around the state. And one way to start doing that is to make sure everybody knows about it. So we invited uh, Eugene's Cahoots program and also a Marion County program to come talk to us about alternatives for emergency response. So uh, for some years, I've been a believer, I guess you might say, in let's have the right response for the right situation at the right time. I will never say that it's appropriate to defund police from responding to the emergencies that require that level of response. The public wants and needs to be protected from the most dangerous situations. However, the state legislature funds um, the state police, but we don't fund local law enforcement. 
we do fund, as I think this question is getting at, we do provide funds for mental health um, evaluation and treatment, for example, uh, and other types of human service and health agency programs. It, it's an interesting point how the Ways and Means process might want to use some of those program monies to suggest counties or local governments might want to use it to augment police response. But you know, this, this is going to be different from one community to another, and it's got to be a collaboration uh, not only between the nonprofit organizations the healthcare community, the hospitals are involved, but it, it uh, should also involve um, uh, neighborhood organizations, for example, maybe even the faith community in serious discussions about how to respond to certain situations. Uh, it, it, I don't think the state can mandate solutions for local government, but I certainly hope that the program that Eugene has led the way for the nation, frankly, for many years, I would hope to replicate that. And I will redouble my efforts that I started in 2015 to make sure that this is at the top of the radar for how do we, uh, I guess you would say, rejigger our budget to, to make it happen, but we cannot, uh, we, we can't redo local budgets. Local budgets, uh, it, it's the local officials who are accounted to those who elect them. It, it will work better probably if it's a um, bottom up effort. If And I think it will percolate. I think citizens are very, very interested in seeing this. So I hope it percolates that way. And the other, the other collaboration I think that's extremely important is the 911 dispatchers. They have to be uh, um, very closely linked to the efforts so that uh, the calls are being dispatched to the appropriate entities for response. Okay, we're all over the map here. So I'm gonna go to something, well, this is still about the legislature. Do you foresee better cooperation between the two parties in this legislation, legislative session? I'm going to hope for that. I always go in hoping for this. And we have a new class coming in that's very eager and enthusiastic. And when you have that kind of enthusiasm coming into the mix, I certainly hope so. I'm very troubled by the tone at the federal level. I'm very troubled by national politics. I expect that's going to calm down. I, and if it calms down at the national level, I think that will help it calm down at the state level. A number of my bills and a number of other bills that were passed uh, were very, um, it, 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 we're bipartisan. In fact, I, I'm going to look at while I'm talking here. I have some information on bipartisanship somewhere. the The number of bills that are passed unanimously or bipartisan is very, very large. And um, in my committee, the Revenue Committee, for example out of all of the bills that came from legislators, about half of the bills we passed were agency generated bills. About half were legislator generated bills. Three of them had a Republican only chief sponsor. A number of them had a Republican and Democratic chief sponsor. And then some were Democrat only chief sponsor. But I think it demonstrates that in my committee, partisanship played no role in hearing bills or passing bills. And other committees operated that way also. I expect us to continue to do that. You know, um, 
it, there's a lot of hype and a lot of concern about uh, a, a lack of working together. But I think that's because it gets a lot of media attention. If you dig into the details of what bills are passing, who's working together, who participated in helping amend something to improve it, I think you'll find out that behind the scenes, there really is quite a bit of collaboration. Excellent. Um, regarding your comment about uh, running out of time um, for doing any kind of census uh, work, uh, could the governor call a special session in the, after that? Would that be in the yes. reality? Yes, a and the legislature it even has the power to do that itself, to continue meeting. Uh, there are, um, it, it takes more than just a simple majority, of course, but the legislature or the governor, yes, could um, it, it reconvene the session. So it would act more like an extended session. Good. Um, I think another, uh, topic we haven't brought up, but I think it's very important considering the fires. Uh, can you speak to efforts uh, with the climate change crisis? Will, will there be anything on the agenda you think? Oh, yes. I, uh, yes, I think there will be lots. Um, let me think through this. There, there are different pieces to this answer. Uh, some of the discussion, I believe, will be about how to fund firefighting and wildfire response. And that's gonna involve issues related to uh, harvest tax, timber tax, um, and so forth. Uh, right now, the state funds, uh, I'm gonna look at some notes here. There they are. Um, we fund paying for fighting wildfires uh, in, in a couple of ways. Um, there's a general fund and the Oregon Land Protection Fund. I wanted to get the name right. It's a privilege tax on the harvest of timber, but the harvest tax has fallen far below other states, including our neighbor, Washington. So that's leaving the general fund to foot much of the bill. Uh, so I anticipate that discussion is going to continue. We also will have to talk about what are the appropriate uh, land use policies. It, do we keep land use policies as they are or change them? Be, uh, what do we do about the urban rural interface? Uh, what do we do about forest thinning uh, and undergrowth? Uh, how do we feel about um, biodiversity and the uh, ecosystem or forest health. So there are many different aspects ranging from environmental, uh, technical, uh, all, all the sciences will be involved, but there's also the tax, the paying for it aspects, and I think land use uh, also is going to get a lot of attention this time. Involved with land use planning, what, what what tack do you think that will take? Um, more more restrictive, less restrictive. Uh, I don't know. Right right now, it, you're going to see the the part of me that league members have noticed over the years, where I I often point out on this hand and then on the other hand. Uh, true to my Libra Zodiac sign, I guess. Uh, while I think there will be a lot of thought given to what is the appropriate type of development in rural Oregon or in forested areas, what can we protect and how do we protect homes and what kind of developments are appropriate in certain areas, that's happening at the same time that I suspect there are people discovering that since they can work at home now and don't have to be at a physical location in a commercial office building, we could have also inadvertently witnessed a shift toward an increasing interest in living in that rural urban interface area, 
the more suburban or rural area, and that's the area more at risk. So it, I think that's going to be fascinating to watch that play out. Yeah, I, I agree. And um, I have a family of two economists, so I hear one hand and the other hand quite a lot. So I'm used to that. <laughs> um, um, then another important issue now is, do you see any work on the horizon about systemic racism and racial injustice? Uh, yes, I do. Um, well, let's see. In the short session, we did tackle some things, of course. Uh, we addressed some immediate issues regarding police accountability. Some people say what we uh, might uh, describe it as addressing the easiest, most simplest um, and discreet things that we could. But it, it, there are a lot, it, there's a lot more I think that will be done, not only in the area of police accountability, but in systemic racism. In looking at it from many different angles, we've seen a very troubling information from other states about vote suppression, for example. Looking at it from uh, the angle of housing, uh, job applications, the criminal justice system, in just about every aspect of life, every aspect of the social and economic fabric of Oregonians that the legislature can address, I think in every area, there will be thought put to how can we address it. And I left out one of the big ones, education, in the education system with, um, uh, I've always been concerned about closing the learning gap. And there's a, a summer a, a loss of learning that happens over the summer. But for all of those youth who enter the education system, starting at, at, at you know, even uh, pre-K, if, if they start already behind and the gap continues to widen, we're not serving those students well. So we've got to address starting, uh, at, at starting off um, the right way so that every child has an opportunity to, to succeed at their, uh, at, the, at their own rate at, at the best that they can rather than just barely getting by. We've, we've got to support every child. And why, why has it turned out that we can see evidence that we have not supported every child. Okay, um, do you know who will be responsible for the process of getting the COVID vaccine distributed throughout the state? The Oregon Health Authority has submitted a plan to the federal government. Every state has to submit a plan. Uh, it, it, it's a many, many, many page plan to wade through and there are protocols, of course, one of the first questions uh, people are interested in, I certainly was, is who's at the top of the list? Because we've got to make sure that our emergency responders and healthcare workforce is way at the top of the list. And after that, what's next, what's next, what's next? But how will it be distributed? And I've heard all sorts of interesting ideas. I I read an email coming in just a few minutes before I got online with you. Someone wants to talk to me about uh, distributing it through dental offices. Uh, it, it, so there are just many, many ideas about distribution mechanisms. We've heard that there is some hope that this vaccine can be stored safely at temperatures. Um, it, it, it's uh, way colder than my own home freezer, but at generally available uh, 
equipment, I'll just call it equipment, that may be generally available broadly, but we hope that's the case because we've read it has to be stored at such a very, very low temperature to preserve the efficacy so that by the time it's given to someone, it's going to be effective. Good to know that there's a plan. Uh, many, many pages of a plan. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, well, I'm sure it's very difficult and complicated. Um, yeah, okay. Um, it's one o'clock, but can you answer one more question? Sure. Thank you. Uh, do, do you know of any anything concerning transportation? Any bills? Uh, mm, no. Uh, I am not aware of any colleagues' bills related to transportation. I have one that's related to, uh, you won't be surprised, passenger rail. <laughs> well, and, and actually the question was specific to rail. So you have something. Really? Yeah. It, it, well, it, you know, I keep pressing on this issue and I was thrilled when Congressman DeFazio invited me to come testify to a congressional committee last year uh, in uh, Washington, D.C., I testified on Amtrak and the future of passenger rail. I have um, one of the very specific points that I'm unhappy about is our system of incentives and penalties that is paid to the host railroad. You know, it, it, because we don't have a public transportation infrastructure for rail. It's all privately owned. Uh, there's a host railroad, for example, Union Pacific or uh, um, BNSF coming uh, from Washington. There's a host railroad and then the host railroad basically makes time and space available to all the other rail companies that want to travel on that line. Amtrak travels on UP lines in the state of Oregon. The state of Oregon uh, it, through Amtrak has signed, uh, it, it has signed a contract with Union Pacific to agree on standards of performance that, are th that I believe are way too low. And even when the standards are not met, I've looked at the statistics. Uh, you know, I'm a numbers person when I want to be. And we have paid Union Pacific more in incentives than they have paid in penalties many, many times over, even though our passenger trains continue to be delayed instead of getting the right of way over freight. And there are some reasons for that, but uh, the state doesn't have the power or the authority but working with Congressman DeFazio's office and working with our state Department of Transportation, I just keep bringing situations to light that I hope will result in a different structure and a different arrangement. Because we've got to get, I believe passenger rail should be viewed as not a quaint thing of the past, but part of our future. And we've got to make it faster, on time and more choices so that people can choose it and use it. So we've, we've, got, to, we've got to do better. Very good. All right, well, thank you, Representative Nathanson. Um, and thanks to the leaguers and the others that ask questions. Um, a third Thursday for December is in the works. Stay tuned uh, for more information in the Argus and in the email. Happy birthday, Kelly Osborne, ha ha ha. And thanks again very much, Representative Nathanson. Good You're to welcome. see you. Goodbye, be well, and stay that way.